Economy and Technology Summit 2022 in beautiful Kuala Lumpur. I'm sorry that I'm unable to be with you in person today and I wish the summit well. Congratulations to old friends at KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, Tan Sri Dr. Michael Yeo, who is also a member of our Global Advisory Council of the Global Foundation. And also hello to summit founder Tan Sri Dr. Lee Kim Yu and other official guests. Our session has been asked to address this topic, China and the world in the post-pandemic global economy towards a shared future and sustainable prosperity. The subtext, how will the post-COVID global recovery lead to a new shared prosperity? How can China's recovery benefit the global economy? What are the key challenges and issues facing the world post-pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war? What will be the outlook for global economy? We have six outstanding panel speakers. Uh, two of them are still to join us, but I trust that they'll be with us by the time they're due to speak. I will briefly introduce each of them shortly and invite them to speak for a maximum of five minutes, giving us the benefit of their views on the topic. I will then pose questions to each of the panel before we open the floor to questions from those present at the summit. Please have your questions ready, keep them brief, and raise your hand to ensure we have the opportunity to invite you to pose your question. I will then make some brief remarks before we close the session, I hope at the appointed time. Let me briefly introduce the topic to get us underway. Yesterday in Melbourne, Australia, from where I'm speaking, and online around the world, the Global Advisory Council of the Global Foundation held its final meeting for the year. A Global Advisory Council includes Tan Sri Michael Yeo, Dr. Wang Heiyu, Henry Wang, Dr. Bing Zhang, and many other global figures, including Mr. Pascal Lamy, Ms. Helen Clark, Ms. Sharon Burrow. Against the backdrop of the divides that are opening up between East and West and North and South in the world, we discussed the state of globalised action, excuse me, the state of globalisation and the actions that we could mobilise together and separately to help ensure a renewed form of what we call cooperative globalisation. This is exactly what your summit today is aiming to address. A meeting in Melbourne followed a meeting last week in Canberra between the leadership group of our foundation and the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Anthony Albanese, who led the Australian Labor Party to victory and formed Australia's national government last May. Prime Minister Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong, whom, as you know, comes from Malaysian Chinese background, have been extremely active and positive in global and regional affairs since taking office six months ago, which is great news. The Prime Minister not only assured us that he intended to work closely with the Global Foundation, he also indicated to us, as he said elsewhere, that Australia will continue to play a leadership role in encouraging the great powers to work together, not draw further apart. In so doing, his government is already extremely active in Southeast Asia, in parts of our region where we all exist. For us, this is great news, as we all know that we need a world and a region of trade, investment, commerce, exchange, and people-to-people -people links in which China will be an active contributor and to some extent, at least, a leader. The Chinese diaspora across Asia and globally, including in Australia, has a vital role to play. That's why your summit in this session today is so important and timely. We do not have time to lose. So without further ado, let me briefly introduce and invite each of our distinguished panellists to address us. Gentlemen, I'm told that your full bios are already available to our guests, so I will only mention each of your names and titles in turn. And to remind you, you have a maximum of five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Without further ado, our first speaker today is His Excellency Dr. Superchai Panich Pakti, former Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand and former Director General of the World Trade Organization in Geneva. Dr. Superchai. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I would be uh, very straightforward. Uh, I have great concern with the present kind of complexities in the global situation that we are being faced with at the moment. Some of us are calling this situation the situation of a poly crisis. It's a crisis that is composed of so many different 
factors, and they're all not related to each other. They're not all economics. Some of them are non-economics. So uh, while we are trying to resuscitate economics from pandemic to induce malaise, we would need more stimulus measures. But at the same time, we are also have to cope with a war-induced scarcity. And so the measures that we are introducing, including, including the measures that would deal with a situation that has been worsened because of the, because of the pandemics, like expanding inequalities around the world, they're not always compatible with each other. At the same time, what we fear and at the, at the, at the UN level, we have always raised the issues that while we are trying to meet the targets of SDGs, so uh, development goals, we have to work together. Goal number 17, I think, is global partnership. We're not seeing this being realized at all at the moment. And maybe this is a step backward as well, because what we are seeing at the moment is the pace of, of uh, just uh, de deglobalization, of re staying apart and working uh, 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 at different uh, levels and contrasting uh, 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 kind of economic policies. You can see the kind of interest rates tightenings in the West and in the East, in the less of countries, uh, they just couldn't cope because well, they are having to, to stimulate economy. They could not live so much with, a, with a, uh, the lower demand and the, uh, the lower uh, amount of growth at, at the same time. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that at the time of this uh, crisis around, uh, you look at the new book by by our friend uh, Rubini, uh, uh, the Dooms uh, Doctors. Uh, he, he wrote a new book on, uh, I think, uh, global catastrophe or something like that. Uh, it's 10 catastrophes. He mentioned different catastrophes. So numerous, global, global, uh, global climate change, debt crisis, uh, geopolitical crisis, the trade tension between US and China, and technology, technology war, and things like that. Uh, another colleague of ours, uh, Larry Summers, he mentioned to us uh, recently, he said this is the most complex, disparate, and cross-cutting set of challenges that he can remember in the last 40 years that he's been working. And I can go on and on, and uh, the recent summits in uh, Indonesia, G20 summits and uh, APEC summits in Bangkok demonstrate actually the kind of concerns that the global leaders have. So I will conclude. The thing is that what we need at the moment is to turn back, not to turn back, but turn back the tide against globalization. You can see how the World Trade Organization is not functioning at the moment, or oh, functioning less so than before because of the kind of blockage by the U.S., the appointment of the appellate body judges and things like that. The WHO, in charge of all the crisis, pending crisis, could, could, could not have functioned without the support of the, of the membership. And I, I don't think it has received the kind of support from the advanced economy as much as it deserves. So I, I like to, to quote from what President Xi Jinping said in Bangkok just a couple of weeks ago during the APEC summit. He mentioned that we have been actually living off the benefit of APEX openness, integration, and cooperation. I think these are three key terms. You know. it's, it's globalization, but we need openness. We need to keep trade open. We need to avoid trade restrictions on supply of, of, of medicine or, or food. We need more integration so that there will be no borders to cross and, and, and less impediment to trade. And we need more cooperation. Yes. So he emphasized people-centered development and leave no one behind. He emphasized linking ISEP, the CPTPP, and DIPA, the uh, Digital Economic uh, Partnership. He also actually showcased the way that we could use BRI, uh, the, the initiative, Bell and Board Initiative. And we need all of us to uh, adopt environmental friendly development paths, according to the SDGs as well. So these are things that I would like to reiterate as a, as a, I would say, a concluding strategic uh, move that I saw from President Xi Jinping's own remarks in, in Bangkok, and I fully support that. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Superchai. That's very strong and very clear, and you've raised a number of issues that we'll come back to in our question and discussion session. Thank you very much indeed.
Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Fan Gain. Dr. Fan is the president of the China Development Institute and director of the National Economic Research Institute in China. Dr. Fan, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to join this uh, summit. Uh, the, our, the title of our panel is about the post-pandemic, uh, but China is not in the post. You're, you may in the post, but we are not. Uh, mm -hmm. The policies are changing, the, adjust, the adjustment are taking place. Uh, but before we reach the post-pandemic uh, stage, uh, we will have very, very real challenges uh, in the next few months, I believe. Uh, but anyway, it, for the Chinese economy, which is not in a good shape now, uh, we are facing uh, quite a lot of the challenges. Uh, pandemic is one. U.S.-China relationships is a, a very big, very big issue. Geopolitical uh, conflict and the global financial uncertainties, you know, uh, exchange rate, uh, commodity prices, uh, now the shrinking of uh, the global market because of the, uh, uh, you know, hike of uh, interest rate and all the challenges in the, in, in the short run. So this year, Chinese economy is not going to be 4% growth, <laughs> less than 4%. And next year, hopefully, they're getting better, uh, but it's still, uh, it's a quite challenging. But at the moment, I think we we would we should you know look at the those more positive factors. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the global economy, but talking about, for example, the Chinese economy. Uh, we still have a quite a good you know uh, uh, positive things. Uh, the the first of all, China is not in a bad position in the global economy. Our uh, uh, inflation is low, so that gives the room for the policy maneuver. Uh, and the, uh, we still uh, have a very strong export. We have a uh, you know surplus. <laughs> Some other countries now turn surplus to the to the deficit. We still have a very strong surplus, and Chinese yuan have been uh, relatively stable. Uh, so all those are quite a, a positive uh, for the for the long run growth. And also, uh, the second part of the, this positive things is, uh, you know, we have some new uh, global engines, uh, I mean, the growth engines, technology uh, development uh, industries. Uh, this year, China's uh, export of the automobiles uh, reached the very high level and surpassed the Germany uh, and almost reached the level of Japan to export the automobiles. And China's uh, technology and the equipment uh, for the for the new uh, res new uh, energies are uh, quite a productive. I mean, the panel, uh, the you know, solo panels, uh, the wind uh, technology, the storage, the the, the batteries, you know, all those things are uh, very strong development, and that's for the for the future is very positive. And other other things, biotechnology, you know, AI, you know, all all those things, uh, you know, digitalization of industries, particularly the manufacturing industries, is on the way, uh, in a very good uh, positive, uh, 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 you know, the, the 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 changes. And the third part of the positive is that China need more opening up and globalization and multinationalism. China now is content by some large economies, you know, decouple, you know, try some economies try to decouple from China. And then China need more to, to open up, to have a more corporations international uh, in that international market. So that's why uh, China have a new formula for the opening up. That's called the institutionalized opening up. Uh, which included more engagement in the international cooperation. And RCEP start this year had been running quite a while. And I think the uh, very natural uh, China's uh, uh, you know, international uh, globalization uh, is to more open to the ASEAN countries. ASEAN now is a 
you know, lar largest uh, trade partner with China. So with the further opening up and other, you know, I'm not going to talk a detail, you know, very much, you know, on the service sector, financial sector, the China, you know, in the past two years have been really uh, stu institutionalized a lot of the opening up. So hopefully uh, in the long run, I think I'm uh, uh, optimistic China will come back to the growth track and hopefully with more international cooperation uh, engaged with other countries. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fan. And we'll look forward to hearing from you in the question period because you turn from slightly not negative, but a difficult situation to saying there is a lot of positives to look forward to. Some are being achieved. This idea of China going through this new formula of institutionalized opening up is very interesting. And we can discuss that when we come back to it. Let's go to our next speaker, an old friend, Dr. Wang Heyu, Henry Wang, who is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization and former counselor to the China State Council. Henry, thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's great to see you again. And also uh, all the distinguished panelists. And it's also great to, uh, uh, to attend this uh, uh, great event. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I think I, I agree. I echo quite a lot of few what uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers' uh, views. I think uh, the globalization is, needs to be strengthened and uh, we need to really uh, institutionalize more mechanisms uh, to, to promote that. I think there's a, there's a several observation from from my personal point. Uh, first, I think that uh, globalization is at a crossroad. But uh, but if you're talking from Chinese point of view, I think now we are probably seeing at the end uh, uh, light at the end of a tunnel. Now I think that uh, Dr. Fan mentioned that in, uh, China is not in the post-COVID period, but it's starting to <laughs> to to uh, turn around now. And we we see uh, now in Beijing, you don't need a PCR test to go to any. Uh, office buildings now or, 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 or public venues. So, so that's a great thing. And uh, there's no more co zero COVID emphasized anymore by uh, Vice Premier uh, last week now. So, so I think start, things starting turning around and uh, our office has resumed uh, full functions uh, work now uh, since this week. So, so I'm glad to see that finally, even though now China has the highest uh, number of cases, but then there was no, no more uh, a tight situation like we used to see in the past. So that's one first point. I think that really going to lead to uh, a, a great uh, retaliatory uh, uh, you know, economic growth. So, so I would say next year, China should at least have 5.5% or 6% growth. That would be good news for the globalization and for the regional uh, development. So that's number one uh, uh, point that I would like to make. Number two is that I see China now starting to really uh, busy engage uh, uh, global leaders and dialogues and uh, visits. Uh, President Xi actually today is going to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to attend China Arabic Summit. And, uh, and he just come back from APAC G20 and we had a parade of uh, global leaders visiting China, about uh, seven, eight of them just in the last one month. Uh, of course, we're going to have uh, 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 just uh, last week, uh, President Michel uh, of uh, EU was in town, and uh, and maybe in January we have uh, President Macron coming. So, so I, I see that uh, China, you know, actively re-engage the world leaders in face-to-face -face meetings would be a great uh, uh, momentum that uh, uh, you know that we're going to probably make things uh, put things forward. Thirdly, I think that uh, uh, with the Asia Pacific uh, uh, really uh, the fast developing economy. China being one of the backbone of this support. Uh, so, so we would like to see more of uh, uh, RCEP playing more positive roles and then CPTPP, uh, you know, that China really can get more into the discussion and also including the digital DIPA uh, that we can get into that. So, so that would be really uh, also very, very uh, important. And uh, of course, we're going to see China going to hold its uh, third, uh, third uh, Belt and Road International Conference next, next year, as President Xi announced, uh, uh, talked about in uh, APEC uh, in Thailand. So, so I think there's a, there's a momentum that is starting to build up, and China probably could be play more active role uh, in terms of leading this uh, globalizing more inclusive, uh, more uh, uh, supportive of, of, of all the economy. And, and finally, I'd like to say I think Asia is still is the biggest uh, engine, you know, uh, probably in the, in the world. Uh, ASEAN now is, uh, you know, uh, one of the largest trading partners with China. 
the integration of the region, you know, uh, is really important. So we shouldn't have those uh, 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 decoupling or, or uh, cold, cold, you know, cold uh, war mentality. Really, I mean, influence. I'm glad to see China, Japan, Korea is also uh, in some talks, and uh, so we hope that we can really revive this uh, multilateral spirit and really put things forward. And uh, so I think, you know, I'm glad to see Asia Pacific Summit. You know, APAC has been really first time uh, uh, have a such a re-emphasize Asia Pacific, which is a very mature, very uh, developed. So let's really work on this APAC, RCEP, CPTPP. But let, eventually we have FTAP, you know, so that uh, China could, the U.S. can can work together. And also, I hope that China EU uh, comprehensive uh, uh, agreement on investment, the CAI, can be revived as well. Uh, so let's have more of this kind of a dialogue. So I'm, I'm really appreciate uh, what. Uh, uh, Dr. Shupa uh, just mentioned, you know, that uh, WTO should be strengthening. We see some progress at the MC12 minister meeting. We heard from Pasigalami yesterday uh, also mentioned that. But that's really, uh, you know, uh, Steve is really also pushing for the globalization. Let's get all the efforts so we can really also put a floor uh, to this deteriorating downward spiral of globalization. And let's make it a new inclusive globalization. Uh, forward. So I think this meeting is really great. Uh, I think we can really, with with China, you know, finally turning around with the world isolation seems coming to the end. Let's get the optimism back into the narrative and let's really push forward for the more, uh, more, more high speed development. I think by the time next year, when, you know, if China re revived the tourism, China used to have 150 million uh, outbound tourists, you know, so, so let's, that channel will, you know, uh, re, uh, really uh, open that and then really unleash this power of, of uh, uh, traveling around the world and welcome more foreigners coming to China. I'm sure the quarantine will come up, could come down very soon now. So, so let's hope that we are seeing progress and we hope to make it uh, more effective for our friends around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, yes, that's a positive spirit that you're displaying and living with your work, which I know very well. Just before I go to our next speaker, can I just ask the organisers if we have been able to connect Professor Syed Munir Kasru, who I don't see on screen. He is due to follow after the next two speakers, but if he's not with us, we'll continue. So with pleasure, I go now to our fourth speaker, Dr. Li Wei. He is the Professor of Economics and Associate Dean, Director of China Economy and Sustainable Development Centre at the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, uh, I happen to know the Chungkong Graduate School of Business well because the Dean was with us at our meeting in Melbourne yesterday. Dr. Li Wei, welcome to you. Unmute. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and thanks for the organizer uh, for including me in such an important uh, meeting. Uh, what I'll start uh, with uh, a comment on the COVID situation in China. Even though the COVID situation is not resolved yet, but uh, China is, uh, like uh, Dr. Henry and Dr. Fan mentioned, that we're moving into the right direction. We are uh, opening up uh, many of the restrictions and from the COVID uh, zero COVID policy. Uh, so this is going to have, in the short term, perhaps a little uh, softening of the economy and. Uh, but in the long run, we believe it will lead to uh, more uh, robust development and more growth uh, in probably six months from now. And I think that's what we should expect uh, uh, from China. And uh, with that, I think one thing we, we ought to realize that uh, China will make a lot of contributions into some of the problems we see today. Uh, number one is the high inflation in the developed countries and with the Chinese goods now uh, in the in the near future uh, will be uh, more freely available uh, in many uh, uh, Western countries and their inflation uh, will likely um, be more in control. And I think one of the things we learned in, from the past is that the uh, China with more than, more than, I think, 200 million Chinese getting on the global marketplace as workers, and they have contributed greatly to the uh, global supply. And uh, we didn't realize how important that was until the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, trade war uh, with the United States. And uh, in the past, uh, uh, with such 
increased in supply and uh, China has contributed to much lower inflation and in, in many in many cases deflation in some countries, which led to a very ag aggressive monetary policy response. Um, and now that those monetary policy responses are coming back to haunt us, I, uh, uh, which also led to, I think, the bankruptcy of this so-called modern monetary policy, mo modern monetary theory, which uh, literally suggests that the central banks in Western countries can just keep on printing money and without consequence. And now we see uh, that Perhaps the reason that we could maintain low interest rates and for so long has a lot to do with the fact that China and many other developing countries has come in online as a global supplier. Um, and then with the Chinese economy reopening, and I think uh, those situations could be uh, re, uh, reduced as well. Um, so that's one positive thing and looking forward. Uh, and also Henry mentioned that, that, that the millions of Chinese will uh, visit other countries. And so as China reopens and the Chinese uh, consumers will regain their confidence. And so the demand, the global demand will also be added by the Chinese consumer. And so I think that's going to be a great contribution uh, from China to the rest of the world, in particular to uh, ASEAN countries where uh, uh, Chinese consumer tends to uh, visit uh, first um, and in large numbers. And so those are the important contribution to the regional uh, development. Uh, the other thing I think is very uh, important is technology, right? The, the whole reason that millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese and, uh, and also hundreds of millions of Indians and other ASEAN countries, workers can join online in the global supply chain has to do with technology, right? With the digitization in manufacturing and services, many more unskilled workers can operate and those dumb machines, right? Those machines are dumb because they are computer aided. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, the global supply chain is greatly enhanced because of new technology. Um, and then of course that has uh, political consequences in developed countries as well, uh, uh, partly because of uh, the skill uh, uh, in Western countries and become less relevant uh, with computer-aided manufacturing and services. Uh, but that's something that we, uh, in the future, inclusive growth, inclusive globalization will have to address. How do we uh, maintain high growth uh, main and also uh, help other countries with job preservation and perhaps uh, and and also uh, China is moving another direction which I think is very important which is uh, to encourage more consumption uh, and to change the Chinese economic structure uh, away from uh, heavily dependent on investments to one that dependent on consumption and I think that change uh, will be slow, uh, but it's uh, uh, gradually, I think, moving in the right direction. And those are things that we see in the uh, longer future. And I think a re-globalization and re-engagement uh, and bringing the world together uh, in a more inclusive growth. And I think that's a trend that's not just good for uh, China, but it's good for uh, our China's neighbors as well as uh, China's other treating partners as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. And I think, uh, some, again, some interesting observations, including um, you, uh, the, the MMT, um, MMT, Modern Monetary Theory Bankruptcy, was a... Was a <laughs> so we'll come back, but also your use of the term re-globalisation. It's a term that is being increasingly used. I was with the current Director General of the World Trade Organisation just two weeks ago, Bogosi Okonjo Iwiala. And she is very strongly using that term. So we might come back to language and common language as part of our discussion about how we move forward. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite, uh, and I think you have a slide presentation to support you, Dr. Edward Sir, the founder and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company in China. I'm handing the floor to you, sir. And can the organisers please allow Dr. Sir to show his slides? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, as um, the slide is being put up, I can start talking given the time limitation. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, uh, next page, please. Uh, obviously, as uh, all the speakers uh, before me have already spoken about, there are lots of moving parts these, these days, and you are all familiar 
with these challenges and sort of uh, uh, developments in, in, in the world, including here in Asia. Next page. Uh, there are many moving parts, but in the new world, as we sort of talk about today, uh, inevitably a number of things will, will take place, will happen. One is the technology. In my view, technology will continue to advance and digital economy will play an even larger role than what's been so far. Uh, and, uh, however, uh, the digital divide, meaning the difference between the digital competence across countries will actually worsen uh, if it's not properly checked. So I think this is a very important element for many of the multilateral organizations to, uh, to pay attention to. Second is, regardless of what some countries may want to think about, a multipolar world order will likely emerge. It may not emerge in full fledge. In my view, it would emerge in some kind of fashion. Number three is we are already beginning to see the global US dollar dominance is being chipped away. And I think that chipping away will continue to happen, albeit uh, perhaps slowly. It is probably not gonna happen in a very dramatic manner, but nonetheless, this direction is already very clear. Number four, environmental climate issues are getting global attention, but progress varies greatly across countries. I think we all know that. Uh, it depends on the ability of countries to address these kind of issues. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not gonna be easy to reach a consensus across all countries on how to deal with these global issues. Um, while, in my view, while forces to partition, to, uh, to partition uh, what a lot of people call it decoupling, would be around. There are forces that will drive decoupling. However, in my work with my many of my clients who are CEOs and senior leaders of big corporations, uh, in general, companies are not looking for decoupling. Companies uh, across the world are looking for more collaboration and they're making decisions on more rational basis than perhaps some politicians. So. I believe that forces to unite will stay in the new world and will continue to manifest. Next page. In this context, China's role will become even more important. It's already the largest trading nation with a large number of countries. We all know that. Chinese style modernization, which is now epitomized by the Chinese leadership as the framework for making progress in the new era with speed and intensity. And this actually is a continuation of the thought process of the Chinese leaders over the last decade or so in his search for the modernity with Chinese characteristics. But now they have turned it formally as Chinese style modernization, which is, an in, a, a, is a comprehensive and inclusive way of thinking about how to make progress for countries, but also for humanity. China could become the anchor for what I call globalization 2.0. Uh, you know, we can also call it re-globalization, but I believe that globalization 2.0 would be different fundamentally than what we saw in what I call globalization 1.0 in the last 30 years. But nonetheless, it, in my view, the logic will push for globalization going forward. And in this new era of globalization, China would become even more important and could become even the anchor of it. 30 seconds, thank you. Yeah, okay, right away. China's innovation will create significant impact in other parts of the world, including in Asia, in particular in Asia, actually. An increasing prominent role of global affairs, regional blocks, and BRI. Next page, finally. Uh, in my view, business logic, I'm talking about business leaders, global companies are a major force in the world. Not only about, it's not only about politicians or countries, but global businesses also play a major role. Ultimately, business logic will prevail. Global issues like climate change, pandemic, will affect everyone. 
mega trends such as quick power arms race technology, digital divide are creating bigger gaps between the haves and have nots. Globalization 1.0 benefits many people in the world. Globalization 2.0 is a much better vision than small clubs with friends. Finally, creating a shared future for the humankind requires wisdom from political leaders, but business leaders will always make the decisions based on business logic. That's the end of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed for what I would call a lot of wisdom in your presentation. And uh, well, let's return to those topics in the questions and discussion session, which are very positive and uh, also very encouraging. And I see some patterns emerging from our speakers. Now, the good news is that our sixth speaker is with us. He's uh, actually physically present, and I think online, Professor Syed Munir, Munir Kazaru, the chairman of the Institute for Policy, Advocacy and Governance in Bangladesh. Over to you, Professor Kazaru. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of Global Chinese Economic and Technology Summit. It's good to be back in the pro, I wouldn't suppose pandemic. We're getting out of there. We are not yet. And good to see many of the friends and colleagues around. And I was listening carefully to some of my previous speakers. So in the next four or five minutes, what I'll try to do is to give you a quick recap of what's happening globally, particularly in the sphere of developing countries what are some of the immediate challenges, and what China specifically can do. Uh, we live in rather very interesting times. On one hand, we have the digital transformation, and we knew, we all of us know that how the pandemic has really accelerated digital transformation, and the growth has been phenomenal. I mean, if you look at the last two years, uh, the growth of internet users jumped somewhere between 17 to 20 percent whereas it was only 7 to 8 percent in the pre-pandemic years. But what has happened, unfortunately, though, uh, because of the pandemic, many of the developing economies have taken a heavy hit. And uh, the Sustainable Development Goal, SDGs, as we know, the Agenda 2030, is far, far behind the schedule and hanging by the threat. And many of the progress we have achieved in the MDGs have taken a reverse uh, turn. So what has happened, many developing countries, which were hovering around 5% growth before the pandemic, has shrunk into below 3%. And add to that the Ukraine war, the supply chain disruptions, the soaring energy prices, food prices, these are rather very challenging times. And we are in a situation where people in Europe are struggling how they're going to cope with the winter. And we are seeing uh, from Europe to Asia, people scrambling from energy sources. At the same time, many people in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, struggling to put food in their table. So we have a very diametrically opposite world that we are moving, unfortunately, as opposed to the post-pandemic recovery, reboot, and transformation that we all we are hoping for. So these are rather very interesting geopolitical situations. And you cannot uh, sort of isolate one with the other. These are very highly interconnected. So we are having impact on inflation. We are heading towards recession. So it will take a while before we are out of the woods. And in this challenging situation, unfortunately, we are entering more and more in a rather divisive world. Being the co-chair of task forces under both G20, which you know represent 20 most powerful economies of the world, and also G7, uh, the seven industrialized uh, democratic societies, I have had the opportunity to spearhead SDG, digital transformation and global governance. And in course of my work, I have seen, unfortunately, we are charting into a world where we are getting sharply divided. What can China do? Okay. As we know, before the pandemic and everything, China in many cases was leading from the front. And in many instances, like the RCEP, China has done a great uh, job, and sometimes I say it openly, in many cases, Chinese have outperformed the American economic diplomacy. So you have 15 countries with uh, more than $12 trillion worth of market, and you have uh, 2.5 billion people under RCEP, which gives a lot of rooms for optimism. So China has to lead from the front. And during the post-pandemic era, the trade, connectivity, those things are areas where China has a great opportunity to lead from the front. Having said that, I will be very frank as a friend of China. 
there are also issues with some of the things that happens. Take the case of Belt Road Initiative. It has come under a lot of scrutiny. There have been a lot of questions on the level of governance accountability that goes on, which China needs to do to look very carefully. Otherwise, uh, there is always a risk countries like Sri Lanka and others, which has been suffering fairly or unfairly, to a certain extent, the fingers will be, fingers will be pointed at China. So there needs to be more accountability governance. Secondly, China has also very commendably built the development arms. So Asian Infrastructure Bank, which now works in tandem with ADB World Bank, is a very good mechanism for China to help the developing countries. And also we have already seen AIB teaming up with ADB World Bank to extend development finance. And also China might wish to look into some of the debt relief it can give to many of the countries which are reeling under a lot of heavy debt burden. So this is the time to reboot, reinvent, re-energize, and China can easily lead from the front. Now, the Ukraine war definitely is taking a toll. I personally believe China is in a very good position to play a more effective diplomacy rather than being looked into taking sides. Because Ukraine has had very good economic relations with China and was one of the major export markets for Ukraine for cotton and other stuff. So there is no reason, given China's strong close relation with EU and others, it cannot play a mediating role. And this war needs to end for everybody's sake. And somehow we tend to put it, be sort of brush it aside, but this, unless this Ukraine war is out of the door, we will continue to linger to a lot of crises that we're seeing, you know, energy, food, so on and so forth. And digital transformation is a big issue, and China can definitely play a big role here. There's a huge digital divide, even as we meet. The reality is two billion people in the world don't have mobile. Three billion people don't have internet access. If we don't bridge this divide, it's going to have huge repercussions, socially, economy, otherwise. You cannot have a world where half of the people are not connected to net, and most of us having access to online, e-commerce, e-health. This cannot go on. This will become a huge societal source of unrest if we don't shoot it down right now. China has done a great job within the country, and I'm sure it can transport that experience globally. So those would be my very initial remarks. But I, I remain to be optimistic, but I would say with a note of caution, these are rather very uncharted territories in the post-pandemic era. So we need to trade it with wisdom, cautious, and with a lot of drive and energy. So with that, I'll lay my initial remarks. I'm very happy to answer any questions or engage in the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. That concludes our first uh, six speakers and their presentations and we're now going we have 30 minutes remaining in the session which is a good thing and firstly we're going to have some interaction with the panelists and secondary observations i'm going to call for on the back of what each of you have just said in the opening remarks and dr superchai coming back to you and your very significant uh, roles that you've played in recent times you're worried the poly crisis um the SDGs are not being realised, deglobalisation, the tide against globalisation is very strong. You didn't pull any punches, okay? You mm -hmm. said Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, you quoted President Xi at APEC saying, we've been living off the benefit. Mm -hmm. That's a phrase that really strikes me. What's the answer? What's, let's, what's the way forward? If you were back in your job at the WTO today, running the WTO in Geneva. What's what's the answer in the way forward in less than two minutes? Uh, <clears throat> Steve, I, I would suggest uh, at the moment three things yep. uh, that should actually help to deal with it, what I call the uh, poly crisis and to bring us back together uh, in terms of uh, trying to create this, what, what you said about the re re globalization process. The first one is that uh, we should have the kind of summits, I mean, I have seen so many summits in my lifetime, and so many summits have been useful when leaders can meet and actually uh, have a dialogue to reconcile the differences. But the last few summits, uh, I think we should not waste them. Uh, so my first suggestion is that we, if, if we can work towards uh, maybe UN sponsored summits or any summits that already exist, with very specific topic. For example, at the moment, food security. I like the, I like the G20 uh, attitude in Bali very much mm. because Indonesians are uh, very smart. They started off with this kind of issue of the impact of global climate change on 
economic uh, development, and, and particularly food crisis could be one other thing. So I would like to suggest, and we have had several food crisis meetings in the past, but this one is more imminent, not only because of the lack of the production of, of food supply, but because of the trade restrictions. And, and, and much as we are uh, trying to convince countries not to put up any restriction on food trade, I mean, export constraints on, on, on food supply has been quite uh, damaging in the past. So I would suggest the first one is to have a specific summit on, on food supply. Second one, uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Professor Chrissy or some of us, we've been talking about China's role in trying to, to, to uh, uh, lessen uh, the, the debt crisis. I mean, at the moment, a global debt pile is about nearly four times, three and a half times the global output. This is, this is critical. This could be catastrophic. So we, we, need, we need some sort of a, uh, an, a, another debt relief kind of exercise again. And the UN used to organize debt relief sometime like uh, 20 years ago, particularly aimed at African countries. But these days, uh, I, I'm looking at China because China has already extended so many loans to some of the poor countries. And maybe it's a time for China and some of these countries, particularly the poorest one, the LDC, could come to terms on, well, uh, debt relief, debt forgiveness, or whatever kind of reshattering of the debt. This is my second. Point. And the third one, we need, we need urgent reform of the World Trade Organization. And uh, I think the present director general would agree with me that with the state of the trade at the moment, next year trade is predicted to grow by only 1%. Mm. It will be, it will be, you know, close to contracting again, which is, which is well, not impossible for this world because we need trade to expand so that we could re resuscitate recovery. So we need to, to reform the WTO in a serious way and not only to do reform of the WTO, to, to, to do something against the Chinese economy, because it seems to be that the, the proposals of the Western countries to reform is all about state enterprises, state owned enterprises, and subsidies, and, and technology thefts, and all this sort of thing. I think we have to be honest with the way that the WTO has to function well in terms of getting everyone to be heard and, and getting on terms with a real situation at the moment which is a crisis in, 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 in medicine supply, the application of trips uh, and all those sort of things. So we need to have a reform so that the WTO can be really operationalized again and not because it could, it could be blocked by some major economies. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Farn, turning to you and your earlier remarks, and let's go back to some things you said. China's moving from a challenging phase into a new growth phase. There are very good signs regarding uh, for example, global auto exports from China. Green tech is a major player for China. But you said fundamentally to me, China needs more opening up, more globalization. And you, you highlighted this by saying there's a new formula for China of what you call institutionalized opening up and China playing a global role. Can you elaborate on what you mean and what is intended there and what we should be responding to? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Well, fundamentally, we need to understand why China need more uh, opening up, more globalization. The fundamental reason is that China is still a developing country. Developing country need to learn knowledges, technologies from others, all others, you know, to speed up their own development. So that's what we call the latecomer advantage of the, you know, backward countries. Uh, China now have some capabilities of innovation, but basically we are still in the stage of learning, stage of import, you know, try to uh, to invite the, all the knowledges, technologies coming into the Chinese uh, economy. So that's a fundamental. That's why when some, uh, some, some country want to contain China, want to cut off, you know, decouple, and cut off the supply of technology, you know, uh, you know, stop the uh, academic exchanges and even stop the, you know, uh, students go out, you know, go to the certain, uh, uh, certain uh, professions. So, and China try to keep the door open, try to keep the, you know, inflows 
not only the foreign direct investment, but also inflows of technology and the knowledges. That's fundamental reason from the point of view of economic, you know, development economics. And then you talk about the institutionalization of the of the opening up. Uh, uh, it's not a clear formula, but think about the three elements. Number one is the institutions of international treaties. You know, Dr. Subach has here, China benefit a great deal from WTO accession. And the reason for that is that WTO provide a binding international system for China. And China can use that to provide a kind of the, the rules of games for the domestic players. You know, China has a big, big economy. You know, the, it's managed by the different ministries and the different local government. They can behave di very differently. But if you have international treaty, bending treaties, and then you provide the rules for, for those, you know, domestic players. So that's more transparent for investors as well and the treat, you know, treat companies. And second element is about the uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, negative list, uh, which is, has been used the recent years uh, by the government, you know, to uh, have the direct, you know, uh, kind of the rules for the uh, inviting foreign direct investment. Uh, so that's reducing, you know, reducing that list, meaning more opening up. And that's also kind of the bending system domestically uh, for the Chinese government institutions. And the third element is, of course, more uh, regulations and the legal uh, um, legislature uh, on the trade, domestic, uh, 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 not only domestic market, but also uh, for the trade, uh, uh, for the for the internet trading, and for the investment, foreign investment, provide more transparency uh, for the uh, investors. So, uh, from that point of view, things are still moving. And people are still working on, on that. And people, a lot of the institutions now the, have the kind of the research on how to uh, go further open up. But you can see Chinese, Chinese government now really doing something. Well, they support WTO re-globalization. Re uh, they uh, promote uh, the RCEP uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the past years. And then they now uh, people are talking about uh, the, the the CPTPP, you know, possible China joining the CPTPP, uh, and all all those kind of things. And uh, China is now have a uh, Hainan Island as a, a so-called the, uh, the the free port. Uh, that that kind of development is uh, uh, quite a quite a uh, uh, you know interesting. Uh, for China to not only to to have a more opening up of the trade system, but also uh, provide more opportunities for the domestic uh, uh, domestic regions uh, to learn from those kind of the free trade uh, system. Uh, so that's why I, I said uh, uh, it's a it's a kind of a, 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 you know a new uh, frontier uh, of the uh, China's uh, global. Uh, engagement. Thank you very much indeed. Elaboration, clarification. Wang Hei Yu, Henry Wang, you are very positive and optimistic in your views. You are living the idea of globalization that needs to be strengthened with your work. Um, inclusive globalization, it's, a, it's another way of seeing about reducing imbalances and uneven. And you've talked about the various trade agreements that can strengthen up the links that are weaker than they should be. Um, and also you talked about China playing a bigger role in globalising. What what do you mean exactly? What what could you add to the conversation so far that China, the role that China could play? I mean, I was involved in the formation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank very happily. Uh, nearly every country came on board. Some didn't, and I'm delighted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that they did not because they missed the boat. But what could be done to actually strengthen this international cooperation and institutional cooperation from your perspective? 
Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good question. And uh, I, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a several ways. I think first is that uh, we probably should uh, help to, to uh, you know, reshape a bit of a narrative. I mean, uh, we see some countries really propose that uh, uh, democracy versus uh, autocracy, so that, that doesn't really explain the uh, multipolar world we are living in right now. I mean, China has a unique model of hybrid economy. We have a private sector contribute 60% of GDP and another 20% uh, SOE does all the social work and another 20% multinational uh, foreign company does all the import exports. So that's really unique uh, Chinese style of modernization. And also, of course, China has lifted 800 million people out of poverty. And now it's talking about, you know, how about making 300 million migrant workers into middle class. So that's another uh, job China is doing now. So, so I think, you know, first we got a, a narrative that really can be accepted by the world. And then, you know, do not view China as a threat, as a, as a problem. Second, I think also is that there's many things. I mean, climate change is certainly with China can work. Definitely. China is now the biggest emission of carbon dioxide. It has to work with the U.S. and other large emission emitters as well. So China, EU, U.S. should really demonstrate some leadership on that, and we can work together. Thirdly, I think that infrastructure is another common sense, the consensus we had around the world. You know, China has a BI already 10 years now, uh, but then President Biden has B3W, and the EU has Global Gateway, and even G7 said infrastructure project. So why don't we have, uh, you know, AIB we mentioned about here, and uh, World Bank, and ADB, AFDB, all those development banks work together have a big chunk of a BI and a B3W and the Global Gateway, and then really form a, a transparency and uh, you know, let's find something to work together. And also digital. I mean, digital, US is the largest, China is the second, EU is the third. Let's work on the digital thing. So, so I'm thinking you know, that uh, there's many areas, of course, uh, then we talk about uh, uh, energy, food crisis, and also some consensus on, 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 the, on, the, on the justice, like you know, China against the nuclear war, talking to Schultz and talking to Biden. I mean, that's a consensus of international community and also respect sovereignty and territorial integrity. All those are great thing. So we should really, you know, have a common denominator and minimize the differences and find a few good projects to work on, uh, revive the multilateral spirit and have a new Britain Wood moment, uh, you know, after 75 years of, uh, of Britain Wood. So, so I think many things we can work on and dialogue like this and a narrative like this is really important. So, so appreciate that uh, you know APEC and uh, and, uh, and ASEAN and uh, you know RCP, CPTPP, and all those mechanisms can play more role. AIB and uh, BI, BCW, and all those mechanisms put them together to strengthen the globalization architecture and mechanism. Thanks, thanks, Henry. And in fact, uh, one of the points you made was that uh, I was very encouraged as someone who's been involved in the global future on climate change and the need for cooperation, in which China has a major role to play, not just for China's sake, but for the world. It was very encouraging that China and the US are back together working on chairing the climate change working group under the G20. It was a brilliant initiative by Italy in the first place to put these two countries together. And, you know, there's no future on issues that affect the global commons without China and the US working in some ways together. And your point is we should take a lead from those things where we can find agreement and work on those things that we have in common. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Lee, uh, I did say earlier your comments about modern monetary theory and monetary policies in the West and the bankruptcy of modern monetary theory. was That's very interesting because you said it very strongly, as well as quite positive things about the way in which... Um, Technology is developing, China encouraging consumption over investment. Do you, would, would you like to elaborate on uh, monetary policy as it has been practiced, at least in the West, in recent times? Because I think it's a very important uh, dif point of difference that may need to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a very uh, uh, tough question because I, one of the things uh, uh, we've been working on uh, uh, for uh, many, many long years has been trying to understand why in the West uh, we have uh, a very low interest rate for so long and uh, it didn't seem to bring out inflation. And, and that's really puzzling and for uh, quite some time. And I think uh, the pandemic and also the, the China-US trade war created that opportunity for us to look at this, right? Uh, the pandemic in particular is like an earthquake 
we without earthquake or uh, volcan or volcanic activities, we would not have been able to figure out how the internal structure of the earth, earth is, right? We would not know that um, the earth has, you know, maybe a sort of a, a core and so on and so forth. And and with that, with all those uh, eruptions, and we 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 have a better understanding. Now, now this um, pandemic is like a natural experiment, and, and it shows that with a global supply chain breakdown. Uh, and then with encourage with uh, all the fiscal and monetary policy encouraging uh, demand in the West, uh, surely we had inflation. And so that notion that uh, we could keep on um, printing money and without seeing inflation and that era, I think, is uh, ended uh, abruptly and and kind of unexpectedly because we when the policy was implemented, everybody was saying, no, 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 it, it's not possible to have inflation because we, we had been doing this for years. There, there was no inflation. In fact, we worry about deflation. Um, but then with the supply uh, restrictions and we now I have a better understanding. And so uh, with that in mind, and I think one of the things would now we have a better understanding about the, uh, how the Chinese contribution to the world has been. And uh, then we also have a better understanding now with perhaps the um, uh, a, a profound misunderstanding of US policymakers about the Chinese economy. And now, one of the things in uh, many of the WTO talks and uh, American policymakers have been pointing out Chinese subsidies and so on and so forth, SOEs. Um, and I think those, in many cases, are, I think are peanuts. And they are, they're looking at not the major issue. The major issue is not uh, that China is subsidizing industries. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, most of the su subsidies that China provided for industries has not been that successful, uh, just like in the US. Uh, but what has been successful has been the Chinese economic model, which uh, sort of, a, uh, and I think uh, one thing to, has to do with the fact that China has this hukou system, and, and, and the other thing has to do with the Chinese uh, uh, land policy. Uh, and the land policy, which literally means that if you have manufacturing plant, the land provided to you uh, is at a very low cost. But if you have a residential housing and you have to pay very high prices, and which is really suppressing the consumer demand uh, by having these people, uh, Chinese consumers, having to save a lot of money in order to put down down payment for their apartments. Um, and that's really the, the key issue. I and mean, if, if you think about this, this is sort of more of a subsidy uh, on the uh, factor prices and for uh, the Chinese manufacturing uh, and, and that's the issue. And then China is now making changes to this policy, right? Because uh, uh, this certainly can, is not sustainable in the long run in the future. It's not a good for China as well because uh, this high uh, rising housing prices to a level that's uh, so high, uh, it is really uh, having a, a large uh, negative impact on consumption in China as we see. Um, and uh, it certainly uh, didn't help uh, with the international uh, trade and so on and so forth. And so those are things I think China needs to, needs to change. Uh, and I think China is changing. I, I'm very encouraged. So uh, coming on with the end of uh, the COVID-19 restrictions, I, I think we should see more positive changes in China. And, and that has to do also with debt crisis, right? You talked about it, mentioned earlier, we talked about the debt, mostly external debt, but in China, the internal debt are, are even larger and they are tied with the housing. And so how do we resolve this? And it's a very important thing for the Chinese economy to grow in the long run and to move from middle income to the level of high income. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm glad you addressed the subject and your point about subsidies is well made. I noticed the president of France has just been in Washington saying that the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States which is subsidising the growth of green tech in particular, right. enormous impact on the European economy. So nobody wins in the end through a subsidy war. So thank you very much. But conscious of time, we're within 10 minutes to run. Dr. Zip, your speech I thought had great wisdom from your experience, but also you brought the benefit of being an advisor to major global companies. And there was a sort of compelling logic where you suggested that um, the global companies will make things work. It's the logic of business that things will not fall apart even if politics gets in the way. And you, you talked about globalization 2.0 and China rising in prominence in global and regional affairs. 
but you also your wisdom was we're all in this together and a shared future for humankind would you just like to add a comment as a further observation to your earlier remarks uh which aspect would you like to you, would you like me to comment on in particular and globalization will drive forward even if politics is trying to take us the other way certainly certainly um uh i, I work with a lot large number of global businesses uh, at a very senior level. And uh, of course, every person would have his or her individual political tick. Some of them may be on this side of the spectrum. Some of them will be on this side of the spectrum. But they know, all of them is aware that their job is to promote and enhance shareholder value for their company. And therefore, they need to make rational decisions. And rational decisions meaning as measures of how much shareholder value will be increased during his or her run in the in the company. And of course, they that person or they will be uh, uh, supervised by the board of directors. So it's not just one individual making a decision, but it's a group of people making collective decisions on behalf of the company. Every industry is in, is in very different position with respect to global, degree of globalization in tendency towards decoupling or uh, recoupling or coupling and so on. So it, it varies by industry. But overwhelmingly, at least the clients that I work with and I talk to, they may have different political take on China and the West and so on and so forth. But their view is that you know, we're here to create value for our shareholders. Therefore, we need to have an environment that will work best for us. And what is the best environment? The best environment is actually a world that collaborates uh, in, a, in a pretty unified manner. And one can call this globalization. And it's true, globalization of the first 30 years, of the last 30 years, actually worked very well for a lot of companies, including a lot of Western companies, American companies in particular, Chinese companies benefited a lot as well. So a lot of CEOs are asking, why not? Why not continue to have globalization? But we recognize that the world has changed. It wasn't like 30 years ago, China was just a you know, factory of the world where, or a workshop of the world. Today, China is a de facto supply center, but also a demand center increasingly because of the increasing size of the middle class and the ability to consume a lot of products and services. At the same time, China continues to manufacture for the rest of the world, in, in particular for the West. So in the globalization 2.0, China plays a dual role of being a center for supply and a center for demand, whereas perhaps the rest of the world, in particular the West, will, will continue to be a center of, of demand. In this context, and the effort to try to put a abrupt change to this process wouldn't work, in my view, because companies do not agree with partitioning the world. Because they know that if you don't play in the global, uh, you, you cannot have the ability to play entirely on a global basis, your economics will suffer. If you, your market is a subset of the entire global market, you will suffer. If your scale of manufacturing is smaller than what it used to be when you were in a globalized world, your economics will also suffer. And so all these notions about so-called reshoring or French shoring or forcing a certain company to go, go from one place to another, it may sound good on paper. And companies are com coming along in some cases because of one of the reasons, in particular politics reasons, but it wouldn't sustain from an economic standpoint. And so when would this happen? Right now, I think it's a pretty chaotic world, pretty turbulent. And we are probably gonna see continued turbulence for the next three, five years. But over time, economics or business sense will drive things back to a certain, era, a, a certain era of normality. But that era of normality will fundamentally different than the previous years of normality. 
So what I, I my advice to many of my clients, but also I think for many of the stakeholders in this game is to really imagine how that future world would look like and prepare yourself right now for that future world. And of course, you need to pay attention to political rhetoric because they're real in many cases, but at the same time, also know what's going to be the fundamental logic that will move the world in a certain direction. Thank you so much. Um, Thank, very you. Helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes remaining for our sixth speaker, Professor Syed Munir Kazru. Would you like to make some final observations before we close, particularly, as you said, coming from Bangladesh from a developing country perspective, and you are seeing uh, this, the struggles, the diametrically opposed pushes in geopolitical matters, and you're also seeing growth being affected in developing countries. And I think you're deeply worried about inequality and divisiveness growing between the developed world and the developing world. You play a role in it. What do we do? What's the silver bullet that we fire to make this better? No, thank you. Uh, as you can fairly imagine, I mean, if I were to give an exhaustive list, we could have easily spent one full day, but I would uh, tend to put it very precise and start with some low hanging fruits. Geopolitics can get very complex and unfortunately in many ways uh, bad politics drives away good economics. That's the reality we live in. Now if I were to give a choice, I think there are four, four areas where the world can start coming together, including uh, countries like China and US uh, taking the lead. Climate action is a big issue and some of my previous speakers did mention uh, how our Indonesian friends did a good job bringing a US uh, China together during the last G20 summit and G20 summit itself last uh, this year showed uh, India relations were struggling to get joint communique at ministerial level meetings. So we are uh, ch chartering rather difficult course. So climate action is one and then Sharm el Sharek, Egypt, if you ask me, I don't think COP27 went very well. There were more fossil fuel lobbyists than climate activists. There were a lot of no-shows from the big polluters. So climate action is something we can start coming together. Second would be food security. Because uh, Africa is in a serious state, so is many other Asian countries. Food security is something where uh, countries like China, US, EU can come together. How do we ensure nobody in 2022, 23 uh, dies of hunger and starvation, whether it's Afghanistan or Africa, doesn't matter. Human lives are at stake. Third would be cyber governance. This is a big issue. We keep on talking about conventional nuclear weapons, not realizing the biggest threat is coming from the cyber world. And we don't have any rules of engagement. We talk about rules of engagement in the uh, maritime uh, navigation. We talk about rules of engagement in land-based warfare, but we don't talk about the cyber issues. This is a big time threat. And so far, there doesn't exist any unified form of code of conduct for nations. Forget about countries or technology companies. This is something we need to come together. And fourth, with the glo global health architecture, my last point, because the pandemic clearly showed the lack of clear global leadership. US was reeling under President Trump with no clear sense of direction. EU was fighting within itself with IP rules, who exports, who imports. So there was a clear lack of leadership during the pandemic, which led to unfortunately the death of 15 million people. Deaths could have been less, suffering could have been much less. So these are four areas which I think we can start coming together, climate action, food security, cyber governance, global health architecture. I think these would be four areas where hopefully we can try to come together as we try to recover from the pandemic years, as hopefully we try to move beyond the Ukraine war. Thank you. Thank you so much and also for being concise in your four points. We are within one minute of our expected closing time, so we won't be able to take questions from the floor, I regret. But the flip side is that we've had brilliant contributions from these six panellists, all very skilled and expert, and also very frank in their observations and comments. I'm very grateful to you all for what you've had to say today. There's a, there are a few common threads I won't attempt to summarise in the short time left, but working together rather than apart will make a big difference. We have no choice. There are some issues that affect humanity as a whole, such as climate, meeting the world, cyber, uh, even outer space issues like water, where we have no choice but to work together. Secondly, imagining a future without China involved at the centre is impossible. 
and therefore we must do all we can to make sure China is both able and encouraged to be a global contributor and in some cases a global leader. And therefore those who are involved from particularly this region of the world in the corridor in which Asia lies, and I prefer to hear the term Asia Pacific said more often, I hear other phrases used quite a lot. I think Asia still exists and it's a very important corridor in the world in which I happen to live and most of us live in. So look, can I thank the organisers for bringing together quite a brilliant panel? Can I thank the panellists for outstanding contributions and some ideas that I think feed into the work of all of us, including our own work at the Global Foundation, chipping away on these global uh, co collaboration, whether it's globalisation 2.0, whether it's re-globalisation, cooperative globalisation, it is all the same thing. We need a world that's joined up. And it will be new and different, but we need to adhere to some principles of working together. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.